Vermont history students. Hi. Um, whoops. Um, so here we are. It's unit 11. I'm making this on Monday. Uh, and so it's kind of like already into the unit. So I'll just try to keep this really short anyway. Um, but just so you know, I mean, we are approaching the end of the semester. And there's a discussion question for Unit 11, which you need to finish by Wednesday, as regularly scheduled. Then for the last unit, Unit 12, there's no discussion question, um, but town meeting wraps up on Friday, as opposed to Monday like it has in the past, okay? Uh, beyond that, um, as I've been telling you, I'm going away as soon as the semester ends. Uh, so everything needs to get done by Friday, the day I enter the grades. Uh, if you um, uh, don't have anything done by then, uh, I'll probably write you and ask you what you want to do. Um, and if you take an incomplete, it's fine, but it's not going to get dealt with for quite a long time. Um, and that's just how it works out this summer, but I'm really looking forward to my camping trip. Uh, so that's all good, and also, um, at the end of this week, I will go over all of the discussion questions and all the town meetings and tally up people's contributions. And of course, your contribution to class discussion, your participation, is fundamentally what has made this course such a success. And uh, I'm very grateful for all of it, and I want to reward you for it. If you haven't um, contributed to a discussion question, even if it goes back to like Unit 2 or whatever, you can go back and add something now. Um, I, I certainly other students won't benefit from your intelligence and knowledge, but still um, you will um, uh, get the credit for it because you've thought about it and that's really the point. So, you know, if you want to fulfill all of your remaining sort of empty obligations that you need to do. Okay, uh, I think that's it, but as always, write me. Um, Unit 11 goes from the 1970 about to about 2002. And it's bookended by Act 250 and the Take Back Vermont movement. Now, Act 250 is this landmark land use uh, bill, a first of its kind around the country, comprehensively through 11 different standards in um, region, you know, the state's broken up into regions and it has environmental boards that then, um, you know, give permits once all of the uh, um, uh, requirements uh, have been met. Uh, by the people who want to build or construct something. And uh, it's revolutionary. And um, obviously in the years since then, there are people who desperately dislike it. Uh, there are obviously lots and lots of people who like the principle of it, but have problems with different aspects of Act 250. But generally speaking, I mean, the principle is that Vermont needs to be in control of change. Vermonters need to direct that. Vermont has a vision of what the landscape should look like, of what its environmental health should be like, of what appropriate scale is. And that was the problem in the early 60s when Vermont was wide open. People were building like mega huge condo developments. And then you have to deal with the utilities, the water, the mail delivery, the schools, all of those things. And so, and, uh, and just the Bes you know, besmirching the um, ruin ruination of the landscape. And so we end up with Act 250. And that comes at the beginning of a decade that Vermont grew faster in population than the national average for the first time since the decade 1800 to 1810. In the 1970s, Vermont grew at really a quite remarkable rate. And it's not just hippies and communes. It's also people moving up to work for businesses, for IBM. The old Vermont economy, extractive industries, dairying, things like that, going out of style, becoming obsolete. But a new kind of economy taking over, not just tourism, but also technology, medicine, education, uh, and uh, new kinds of agriculture. And so Vermont grew. And uh, Vermont started to get like a cachet about, you know, being um, environmentally aware and being relatively liberal in its politics. Um, you know, famously, it's not that Vermont changed, it's that the Republican Party changed. Uh, but Vermont goes from electing Phil Hoff in 1962 to Tom Salmon in 1976, and then before you know it, you're into the Howard Dean era. And so Vermont's decisively a democratic state, and it's probably its biggest national profile was brought to it by Ben and Jerry's ice cream, you know. Um, to illustrate um, this, um, the nature of how Vermont now is dealing with this new um, it's, it's new um, structure, it's new um, way of looking at itself, is I gave you a chapter from a book called Crossing to Safety. 
And Crossing to Safety is a wonderful Wallace Stegner book. And just, you can read, I put chapter six up, but to summarize it, rich, um, graduate student, dressed in kind of crummy clothes, comes to Vermont, to Caspian Lake in Greensboro, to visit the daughter of one of his professors who he has a crush on. The family of the professor are all upset because their summer home on Lake Caspian is about to um, see across the lake a huge development of roller skating rink and bunkhouses and uh, a movie theater and restaurants and all this. And it's going to ruin their view and make the lake really noisy and way too busy. And to make a long story short, uh, the guy Sid, the young graduate student, turns out to be extraordinarily wealthy. His dad was a big banker. And Sid goes and offers the farmer twice as much money that this syndicate was offering them uh, to develop it. And he's just going to leave it undeveloped. And the family's very excited. And Sid and Cher Comfort get married. Um, but you know, you, we've gone from like the Gilded Age when downhillers wanted development and as much as possible, and uphillers wanted small farms well tilled, to now this stage where downhillers don't want development. They want Vermont to remain beautiful. But also, uphillers now, especially with the decline of the dairy economy, they need jobs. They need development. I mean, who was going to work at the movie theater and the roller skating rink and the restaurant? The uphillers were. And so, that's a dilemma in which Vermont finds itself, which is, if you have a huge amount of development, you ruin the state. But if you put a huge amount of cap on development, you make it a plaything for the rich. And so, is there the perfect balance in between? Well, my impression is that downhillers thought they were doing a pretty good job of accomplishing that balance in the 1990s. And uh, were quite thrilled on the whole when in um, 1998 the Vermont State Supreme Court ruled that same-sex couples needed to um, have the same rights as um, heterosexual couples. And the product of that was civil unions, which downhillers thought was a perfectly democratic process. Uh, people went to the state house and had three minutes to say whatever they wanted um, in a couple sessions. Uh, but it turned out that wasn't the case. And what began in uh, 2000, really, was the Take Back Vermont movement. And this guy, Dick Lambert, who lived in Washington, Vermont, started making these signs and they spread like crazy in the rural parts of the state. I was at UVM at the time, teaching there, and people in Burlington had no idea what was going on. I was out in, I was a traveling lecturer for the Vermont Historical Society, and I'd see all these signs and to tell people in Burlington about it, they were like, what are you talking about? And so the Take Back Vermont movement picked up a lot of steam, and just to, my take on it, it was about a lot of things, not just civil unions, that was even a small part of it, but just getting pushed around and not feeling like they, the state was democratically run, like they had a voice in the state. It was about school funding, um, it was about, you know, I mean, a variety of things, and that was just sort of Civil unions just sort of spurred it, was the, was the, um, um, the occasion but not the cause. Uh, and so um, it was a great time to be in Vermont. It was fascinating. I loved the Take Back Vermont era. It was so much fun to be in the state because uh, everyone was arguing about who was not who wasn't a Vermonter. But I'll point this out to you. Number one, downhillers didn't understand uphillers. The uphillers were saying, we don't get to make any decisions in the state. Downhillers are pushing us around. And downhillers were like, oh, it's just all homophobia, which it wasn't. So downhillers don't understand uphillers. And uphillers totally made a huge mistake. They didn't see the big picture, which was Take Back Vermont only is on one side of the divide. They were only talking to each other. They should have said share Vermont and talked across the divide to Vermont to downhillers. And downhillers have been like, oh, we'd be happy to share Vermont or whatever, you know. But they didn't because they didn't see the big picture. They just said, let's take back Vermont. And to win. I mean, when, there's been downhillers here since the beginning. So it was all a giant mistake and a horrible thing and it was wonderful, it was a great era. But the question for you, you know, is conflict, to kind of sum up the whole course, is conflict when the most progress is made towards reconciling freedom and unity, is times of conflict, or is it times of conflict is just when you batten down the hatches, wait for it to end, and then when things calm down and there's relative stability and harmony, is that when you move towards reconciling freedom and unity? And that's the question. And always I have to finish, like, kill like 10 seconds of, um, Time. Look at this. This is my electric 12 string, Dan Electro. Is a beautiful, beautiful guitar. And uh, is impossible to keep in tune. Tuning 12, electric 12 strings. Um, not my favorite thing. Alright, bye.